What is the first thing you can ever remember saying that you wanted to be when you grow up? I remember one of the first times my parents ever asked me that question. We were driving in the car. I was sitting in the back seat and I was looking out the window and my mom asked me, hey Matt, what do you want to be when you grow up? And as she asked me that question, I saw a guy twirling one of those signs on the street corner, uh, flipping them around. It was one of those company signs trying to get people's attention. And I was so amazed by his moves that I said, I want to do that. Now, they were not very excited about that answer, but over the years, as that question was asked over and over again of me, I always found myself giving different answers. You know, a computer programmer like my dad, a chef, an artist, an explorer, a musician, an actor, the list went on and on. Some of those things I did and some of those things uh, just became distant dreams. But sometimes our decisions or desires about the future are short-lived. But the interesting thing about that question of what's next is that we always seem to have an answer or a desire. There was always a sense that we are made or destined for something greater than what is happening right now, that we are called to something greater. And that is called a vocation. Now, you may have heard this word like if you've ever heard of vocational school or something like that. So the word can sound like it is about work, and it kind of is, but it's about meaningful work. In fact, the word vocation comes from the root word vocare, which means to call. Your vocation is a calling, and it's a calling that you specifically have from God. We all have a vocation. In fact, we all have multiple ones. Vocations come in three different categories. There is the universal vocation, which we all share, and then every individual has a primary vocation, and that's usually with a capital V vocation, and then we have secondary vocations with a lowercase v, which are other things that we're involved in. But I want to spend some time talking mostly about the first one, the universal vocation. We all have the same universal vocation. It is called the universal call to holiness. And this means that, above all, you and I are called to be saints. Did you know that? Did you know that you were made to be a saint? Now, you may already have an image forming in your head of you in religious attire, living life as a hermit, thinking like, I'm definitely not answering that call. But that is not what it means. You don't have to imagine yourself on a holy card already. Every single person in heaven is considered a saint. Every single person. So if you want to go to heaven, do you want to go to heaven? I thought so, then you want to be a saint. Now, there are some saints with a capital S who have been officially recognized by the church as people who lived heroic lives of virtue. Those are people like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Timothy. Those saints are declared official saints by the church through a process called canonization. They are canonized saints. They're saints with a capital S. But everyone else in heaven is considered an unofficial saint, with a small, lowercase s. So either way, you and I are meant to be saints. How do we do that? How do we become saints? We follow Jesus. We seek to be holy or set apart. We seek to follow him as his disciples. And being a, a disciple, it means not living for this world. It means that we live differently than everyone else. That's what it means to be set apart. You know, we live in a world that wants to label everyone and everything. As if there will be a day where we have a category that covers every single person, makes everyone feel valued. And that's good to feel valued and make sure that people are included. But the problem with that approach is that we will need so many specific categories that we will end up all being separated again. As Catholics, we recognize our identity is not only in our political party, our gender, our sexuality, our race, our ethnicity, our background, our family history, our geography, our socioeconomic status, the list goes on. Many of those things are very important parts of who we are, but if we reduce ourselves only to the parts, we no longer identify ourselves as a whole person. We might think, I am how I feel, or I am where I'm from, or I am who or what I love. No, those things are parts of you but they do not describe the full, complex, gifted, and beautiful masterpiece of God that you are. The only overarching identity you have is the identity of a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
that is called to be a child of God. That's who you are. Each one of us deserves the dignity that comes with that identity as children of God. And we're each called to live it out in a beautifully unique and powerful way using the gifts and talents God gave, gave us. Only in that identity do we find our fulfillment, the fulfillment of our deepest longings for love, belonging, truth, goodness, and beauty. That is something every saint recognized. That's why we have this universal call to sainthood. Think of it this way. To be a saint is to become like Jesus. And he's the son of God. And we are also actually considered sons and daughters of God. So think about this. Did you ever realize that Jesus did not need to be baptized? Like he was perfect. But when he was baptized, what happened? It says, a voice came from the heavens saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Even though Jesus didn't need baptism, he experienced it as an example for us to tell us what to do, to reveal to us that by our baptism, those same words become true for us. This is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. Did you know that? Did you know that God is proud of you? Did you know that he loves you? Did you know that he is not some distant judge, but a loving father who takes care of his children? Did you know that he is in love with you, that he is with you? And as children in any family, we have certain responsibilities. You have certain chores, duties, or obligations in your family. And when we're baptized into the family of God, we have responsibilities as well. We become part of the family of God with a new set of family responsibilities to live a life in pursuit of heaven to answer the universal vocation, the call to holiness. We have a specific calling from God that only we can fulfill with the unique gifts God gave us. No one else can do it for us, and we can't do anyone else's. That's why it's always so fruitless and dissatisfying when we try to be someone or something that we are not. When you're baptized, you receive that family name, a unique identity within that family. And when you're confirmed, your job then is to go out into the world carrying that family name with you and trying to make it proud. Just like a child would leave home and go off to college or into the workforce would say, I'm going to make you proud. I'm going to do the Zemanek family proud. Our confirmation is us saying to God, I'm going to make you proud. I'm going to go do heaven proud and live differently from the rest of the world. That is our identity as children of God striving to be saints. That's what it means to live out this universal vocation to holiness. Living that way, it's a call to holiness. It's difficult. But I spend time talking about this because I think so many people look forward, look at their future, and they obsess, and they nitpick, and they just get so driven to put all of their eggs in these hypothetical baskets that they think, once I achieve this, once I get there, then I will be happy. Then I will be who I was created to be. But no, you can answer the universal calling. You can fulfill your universal vocation right now, wherever you are, by seeking to become like Jesus, by being set apart, by being different than the world, by being holy, the saint that you were called to be. That is our primary goal. That is the purpose of life. That is what will get us to heaven. But beyond that, as I said, every single person has then a primary vocation and a secondary vocation. And so the next one is our primary. This is basically the state of life that God calls you to. So sometimes it's temporary and eventually one becomes permanent. And there are four of these different vocations. So the four primary vocations are the chaste single life, marriage, religious life, or priesthood. So every single one of these vocations is a unique way we're called to live out our universal vocation to holiness and how we live out our relationship with Jesus. So if we're single, Jesus is our first priority and we pursue him in our loving family, in the community, in other relationships. If we are married, Jesus is our first priority and we pursue him with a spouse and the family that we build. If we're in the religious life, Jesus is our first priority, and we pursue him with our fellow religious brothers or sisters. If there are men who are called to the priesthood, Jesus is their first priority, and they pursue him with their brother priests and with their parish or missionary community that they serve. Each one is a different way to do essentially the same thing, to pursue 
Jesus in community with others so that our gifts can be used to bear fruit and build the kingdom of God. And that leads to our secondary vocations. These are the other ways we are called to live and the other responsibilities we have where we can use our gifts to glorify God, to seek to live as saints. These are our different roles as students, employees, citizens, mentors, members of organizations, different hobbies or passions that we have. These are the unique ways we are called to serve and live out our universal vocation while always keeping as first priority our primary vocation. So myself, for example, my universal vocation, like yours, is to be a saint. And so I try and do that every single day in the way that I live. I live that out primarily in my primary vocation of marriage, trying to pursue a relationship with Jesus in a faith-centered relationship with my wife and leading my family to heaven as best I can. My secondary vocations are all priorities under those things. They are my role as a minister, a teacher, a musician, a, a speaker, a writer, a mentor, a trainer, a podcaster, all the things that I do and am involved in. In each of those avenues, I can glorify God using my gifts in different ways. But I'm always doing that as a married man, primary vocation, who is pursuing Jesus and striving to be a saint, universal vocation. So it helps keep things in that level of priority. But it may be easier for me to list all that out for you because I've already answered you know, the calling of my primary vocation and it makes everything much clearer. But maybe for you in some ways the future is still taking shape or maybe you are in your primary vocation but you're not sure about the rest. What do I do? What am I called to or meant to do? What is God asking of me right now in my life? So the way we answer these questions is through a process called discernment. Now discernment and vocations go hand in hand because discernment literally means to separate apart. It is a process of prayer and reflection to help us consider the decisions that we make, to look at our decisions and ask, why do I wanna do this? Is this something a disciple of Jesus Christ would do? Bringing those decisions to prayer and it helps us recognize the guidance and the hand of God showing us where we're called and maybe where we're not called to go. Discernment can be used in decisions about daily life. It's something that, um, is this something that a person who's striving to be a saint would do? But it can also be used in decisions about our primary vocation. Do I feel called to pursue this relationship or not? Should I talk to a priest or a sister about what the religious life or the priesthood is like? Am I ready for those types of life decisions and changes? And lastly, discernment can be used in decisions about all our other lowercase v secondary vocations. Do I change jobs? Do I go back to school? Do I take this class? Do I move out of state? Where do I go to college? Do I date this person? Should I get involved in this or not? Whenever you're discerning a big or a small decision, I encourage you to ask yourself these four questions of discernment. And those questions are, is it open or is it closed? Is it good or is it bad? Is it wise or is it unwise? And do I want it or do I not want it? So first, is it open or is it closed? Is this uh, a plan or a hope I have that's even possible right now? Is this decision uh, that I wanna make something that's even available? Uh, I wanna go to Harvard, but I have a 0.0, .0 GPA. Probably not open, right? The opportunity is not there then it's closed and you cannot do it and you stop here. So you ask, is it open or is it closed? If it's closed, stop. If it's open, you move to the second question. Is it good or is it bad? Now what this means is not just like, is it good, like do I wanna do it? But it's, is this right or wrong, morally speaking? Is it gonna get you closer to God or lead you away from him? Is this something God has revealed to be wrong or sinful or that will put you in an environment that will make uh, sin more prevalent in your life? Is this something I would do if Jesus, Mary, my parents were right here watching me or not? So if we decide it's good, then we continue. If it's bad, then we stop. We cannot do it. But if it's open and it's good, then we continue on to the third question. Is it wise or is it unwise? Now something might be open and good, but it may not be wise in the sense that it, it may not make practical sense because you would be uprooting your life or you it would put you under serious financial strain or it might involve risks that you would not be willing or would not be smart to take at this time or it might conflict with other commitments and priorities that matter 
and that shouldn't be abandoned. This is where sound advice and experience comes in handy. Asking faithful people like your parents, your godparents, your sponsor, uh, people in your tribe of faith, people who you've surrounded yourself with in community, what they think. And if you determine that it is unwise, not practical, then you stop here. But if you think that it's kind of lining up and that it's possible and practical, the opportunities there, it's wise, then you continue to the last question. It's open, it's good, it's wise. And so then you ask, do I want it or not? This is an important last question because oftentimes we do things or make decisions simply because other people do them or assign value to them. But if we're really honest with ourselves and ignore that pressure for a moment, we realize we want something else entirely. You know, if you really don't want it, if it doesn't connect with those deep God-given desires that you have or the gifts you've been given, then don't do it. But if you do want it, then these four discernment questions have revealed that it might be a good, wise, and possibly holy thing to help you fulfill your baptismal mission and glorify God. So if you honestly and wholeheartedly answer these questions when you are considering anything and use them as a guide for your decisions, you will find yourself closer and closer to living a life that is fulfilling your call to be a saint. And it will be easier and easier to discern what your primary vocation will be if you have not decided that yet, or how to be faithful in your primary vocation so that the secondary vocations are fruitful, allow you to use your gifts, but don't get in the way of the other two. Now, you don't need to have some dramatic transformation to do this. You don't need to wear 10 rosaries to strive for sainthood. Uh, you don't need to only speak Latin and walk everywhere on your knees in prayer to discern and have a vocation. Some of you will be called to be missionaries. Some of you women will be religious sisters or nuns. Some of you men will be religious brothers or priests. Many of you will be called to the vocation of marriage. Some of you may be called to the chaste single life, living a life in service of your family, community, and the church. Many of you may already be in those vocations already. But no matter what you do, no matter where you are, God is calling you to be a saint, to pursue him and his truth, but by living out a radically transformed and moral life right where you are. St. Jose Maria Escriva, he was a priest who died in 1975. He once said this in a homily. He said, there is something holy, something divine hidden in the most ordinary situations. And it is up to each one of you to discover it. There is no way, my daughters and sons, either we learn to find our Lord in ordinary everyday life, or we shall never find him. You were born at this time in salvation history, to live in this country, at this age, in your specific family, in your specific community, for a reason. Because God needs a saint in that place, and that person is you. You were made for greatness. Not for your own glory, but for God's. Do not settle for anything less because everything the world promises will never satisfy that hunger you have for love, belonging, truth, goodness, and beauty. It's a hunger to be a saint, to answer the call and mission you were made for, that you received at your baptism, and that you committed or will commit to fulfill at your confirmation. The mission is yours should you choose to accept it, but I guarantee you, pursuing a life of sainthood is a mission that's the most fulfilling, the greatest adventure you will ever embark on. What will that look like for you? What are you passionate about? What do you feel pulled toward or called to do? How can you uniquely make a difference in the world and the lives of others? Start by living as a saint and making decisions a saint would make. So I leave you with some wisdom from one of my daughter's favorite books. There are thousands and thousands of saints you could be, but there is only one saint that I think you should be. Courageous and confident, daring and bold, the Lord didn't make you to fill a set mold. No, with your own unique talents and interests abounding, he's going to use you to do something astounding. With his will guiding you and his love in your heart, the best saint you can be has been you from the start. Oh. Hmm. That's God calling. Hello? Oh, it's for you.